Ashok Shetar, Vice Chancellor, KLE University. I, I welcome Namaskar, sir. Namaskar, sir. Dr. T.V. Mohandas Pal, Chairman, Manipal Global Education. Everybody. I welcome, welcome Professor Himan Shukai, Director of IM Indoor. Thank you. I welcome Dr. Harivansh Chaturvedi, Director of BIMTECH. Namaste. Namaste. And I also take great pleasure in welcoming <laughs> Professor Manoj Kumar Kumari, Director of NITI Mumbai. Uh, without wasting any further time. Uh, yeah, without wasting any further time, we would continue with the discussions for the today. I would request uh, Honorable Vice Chair, Chairman, Professor M. Punya, sir, to please do the topic. Before I uh, tell Professor Punya, sir, to come on with the topic per se, uh, just for a matter of information for the complete panelists, this thing is getting today's activity is getting recorded live, is available on the YouTube. At the same time, in addition to the panelists, there is a separate uh, box which is having the attendees. Uh, as a regular feature, we have been attendee, uh, having attendees crossing the large numbers from AICT approved institutes, both faculties and the students. And the forum for the day is we continue uh, having the topic discussed with the panelists. Later on, all the issues, questions, recommendations, or any suggestions from the attendees is taken and that is addressed threadbare. Uh, may I now request our Honorable Vice Chairman, yeah, Professor? Chairman, 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 Sir. Chairman, Sir. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Respected Ashok Setter Saab, respected Pai Ji, Sriman Chaturvedi Ji, Professor Manoj Tiwari Ji, and participants who are connected today. We are discussing on new education policy and how it has to be implemented. It is eighth day. We have divided whole new education policy in eight parts. And we have started with how gross enrollment ratio it has to be increased and uh, what what shall be the role of online education odl education like this one second one uh, we have done about the, the the funding for for this purpose in new education policy it is written that six percent of our gdp it has to be spent for effective implementation of this new education policy what should be the mechanism even there is a mechanism for national research foundation also that is a proposal in new education policy then we have discussed about internationalization internationalization of this education it is being felt that many of our students are going outside india and use money it is being spent that too in the form of foreign exchange but we are unable to attract many many students and particularly from developed nations then how innovation research it has to be improved in our um, uh, technical education institutes and then uh, we came to next part for how values and scars traditions which country is having how our indian knowledge system which we are having it has to be implemented in our education and according to that one how teachers it has to be trained <clears throat> so that was again one of the the, 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 the important um, conclusion of this new education policy and, and just day before yesterday, on, on Friday, we have discussed on vocationalization of the education, the component of vocational education and uh, through vocational education, how this, this, this whole education system in the country in the form of good skills into the, the, the students can be inculcated and how the difference between this vocational education and regular, regular education can be narrowed down. <clears throat> Finally, we have reached to the point that how governance of the institute it has to be. Whatever we are saying in new education policy, many, many dimensions, new dimensions are attached to this new education policy, but it will be implemented only when we'll be having a strong, transparent governance system. And according to that one, management it has to be, and very, very important, strong leadership in the institutes will have to provide. So that sort of, that sort of dimension, we were going through this new education policy, in new education policy, it is being said 
that when we'll be implementing this this policy, first and foremost is board of governors. The, the member of board of governors and the chairperson in the board of governors, they should be the, the, the visionary people in the country. They should be able to deliver according to the requirements, according to the needs of the students and finally needs of the society. That sort of vision, that sort of mission they, they let to have. And in, in board of governors, skilled people in, in special areas, in special regions, they should be skilled, they should be competent enough and they should be transparent. And even when leadership is being selected for the institute, the role of board of governors should be, and board of governors should be responsible, in fact, for identifying strong leadership in the institutes. There should be not, um, there should not be any intervention from the government side or any other agency while while selecting these leaders for these academic institutes. So that sort of dimensions are it is being given, and it is being said by 2025. 2030, majority of the institutes should be autonomous institutes. They, they should be having a strong accreditation, quality assurance system in the institutes as well as at national level. So when we'll be having this accreditation system and autonomy to the institutes we'll be giving, there is no doubt about that one, that leadership should be strong. Then only we'll be able to implement this autonomy issue and they'll be able to do justice with that autonomy also. I was going through the, the, the case studies of College of Engineering Pune, as well as the, the, the case study of VVP uh, Ubli, VVP Ubli, from where Professor Setter sir is coming to this one. Now, writing a vision document in the form of new education policy, it may be may be an easier assignment, but implementing that one, that's that's real testing. So, sole purpose of today's um, this this meeting is that in new education policy it is written that strong strong governance mechanism it has to be in every institute so that the the expectation of the society can be fulfilled but how will do with with the, the the existing situation in the country with the existing pressures which are coming how we should have a transparent mechanism and from where we should start so my my first request is from ashok setter saab how we should start in what way in bvb you people have done that from a semi-government institute, just only semi-government institute, and now you have converted this one into a university. So what were the stages and what was the starting point? How we should do the take of this one? Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, just, um, uh, yeah, uh, you are able to hear me? Ah, very clear, sir, very clear. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, for uh, uh, giving me to share my few of my thoughts about governance. Uh, whatever I am sharing uh, is not just uh, the experience of my own institution, but also as a member of an expert ex advisory group of NPIU, uh, World Bank uh, in TechQuip 2. I interacted with almost 180 institutions across India in the matter of governance. One thing I would like to stress here is that the weakest point in Indian higher education system or Indian higher education institution is governance. It is given the least priority. Even in TechWip 2, we struggled hard to bring the focus of the institutions on good governance. Okay. Uh, so it is a, uh, uh, really a challenging area. When we started at BVB, uh, it was surprising that uh, after the existence of 50, 60 years, we did not have our own governance document, institutional governance document. Same is the case with almost all institutions across India. Okay, so uh, uh, for us to bring clarity about the governance within the board members, within the stakeholders, first is bringing out a document which clearly spells what as a leaders, we mean by the institutional governance. That was the first challenge, I would say. Uh, I mean, formulating this governance document and engaging 
board members into it uh, is very essential. Apart from this, the credibility of the board members, what kind of people we bring into the board is also important. You see, uh, when I looked at most of the institutions, so institutions across India, we have institution, government institutions, we have aided institutions, we, are, we have private institutions. Now, when uh, there are government institutions are there, their chair as well as the board members are defined by the respective states. Okay, so sometimes it was surprising me for uh, uh, to find that education ministry is the chairman or the principal secretary is the chair in some of the states. Okay, chairman of the uh, board. So in aided colleges, it is the combination of the government and the management. And when we go to private colleges, most of the boards were okay, family centric or trust, uh, or, I mean, uh, confined to their own society or trust. Very little presence of the independent board members who bring credibility uh, 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 to the uh, table or who bring different kind of experiences to the table okay so what i believe is we need to arrive at the what should be the structure of uh, 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 the board of governors okay uh, probably one model for all institutions may not be possible preferably categorizing the institutions as three types what i said then uh, like that whether government private what should be the structure of the board? What kind of uh, 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 background or competency uh, uh, the board members need to uh, have? Uh, particularly, it is very essential that the first board, when we roll out NEP and say, this is the day from which it is being ruled out, uh, rolled out, then uh, um, we need to see that a very credible, uh, board is in place okay uh, when uh, the board has to come from uh, board members have to come from uh, diverse background but at the same time there need to be independent board members there must be a mechanism to select independent board member they may be from industry they may be from corporate world they may be from higher institutions of learning but they need to be there. They are the people who can really stretch an institution. Okay, ask a critical question. See, one uh, uh, character that is missing in our typical boards is people don't ask critical questions. Okay, so uh, that is very important. So one is people, the second is process. Very, uh, it is very important that the board of governors should know what is their role and responsibility. Many times there is a confusion here. Okay, the institution uh, develops its strategic plan, board members are not aware or have not party participated in it. We don't see it in any of their deliberations. So what are the roles and responsibility of the board members? That clarity also need to be there. What you are supposed to focus on, okay? So what are those processes uh, 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 the board, may, board need to focus on? How it uh, measures the performance of the institution, okay? Uh, what are the key performance indicator it looks for? How it evaluates uh, the head of the institution? See, again, it is missing here. Oh, systematic scientific evaluation of the performance of the head of the institution. At the same time, one more uh, learning I had was, is there a process to evaluate the performance of the board member himself? That is also, again, a critical. When we say good governance uh, uh, and uh, uh, a role is given to a board member, 
naturally a kind of a performance is expected from him so is there a mechanism to measure the performance of the board members so it was hard for us to tell our uh, board members that these are the processes we need to adopt but fortunately uh, because of the kind of people that uh, that were brought into the board we were able to convince uh, and uh, uh, whether it is a conflict of interest uh, all these things we brought out in the form of a document and diligently followed uh, uh, the process that made a big uh, 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 difference to us that's what i think uh, is my experience how we should start uh, in implementation stage from where we should start first your own suggestion itself that self review of an organization is very very important very true. how that self review yeah. has to be this is uh, in governance we need to understand when i benchmark myself with good governance practices there are good governance practices uh, available or uh, in fact the world bank itself has come up with a document of good governance for higher educational institution particularly engineering institutions okay so we should start asking ourselves the question in governance when i benchmark myself with these practices of good governance where i am okay I, have i uh, uh, i mean spelt out the accountabilities of the board of governors okay uh, what is the accountability of the bog have i clearly communicated uh, 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 the expected roles and responsibilities so in every aspect of good governance we need to benchmark ourselves most importantly for example uh, when we say a bog has to op operate in a uh, clear and transparent manner so what is the way in which i share the information of bog with the stakeholders so we need to in the self review we need to benchmark ourselves against the good practices then understand the gaps so when we benchmark we'll know okay this is how our structure uh, is not right this is where our process gaps are this is what we are uh, uh, we are not doing so when we come across such gaps we need to develop a strategy okay to overcome these gaps in each of the gaps we need to have a specific plan and proceed further to overcome those gaps so it starts with the self review and being aware of the gaps when you benchmark with the best practices uh, mohandas pai sahab the sometimes back i visited manipa main campus main campus i visited i was part of that committee which was assessing uh, the, the manipal uh, group on the base on 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 the theme that institute of eminence in that committee i was and we were supposed to assess the capabilities of the organization in what way the, the institute is doing and uh, what is the vision of this institute in what way they'll be performing in time to come one very very important thing which i noticed there every role was being played by vice chancellor and according to to the directions of the vice chancellor whole institute was working so that is at the leadership level the leadership was so strong everything was moving it was vibrant and and institute is progressing there is no doubt about this one as far as governance is concerned no one was there from board of governors even chairman you no one was there and still institute is doing wonders in fact so one one another dimension it can be which we can understand if there is no interference from the governance and if your leader is strong still miracles can be done if autonomy is being given by the, the, the governing system by governance that that leader is strong they are having faith and they are giving full autonomy 
you please do you please plan and it should be for the betterment of the students sir what what is your thoughts about the capabilities of a leader well let me answer that question after uh, sharing a few thoughts and i think what we should do because we are a, a small group of aicte aict is the regulator for the country and you have a very large responsibility of regulating 11000 institutions and manipal and others are not an example for all 11000 it is not possible for everybody to put in that kind of mechanism and governance it is not possible let us accept that because there are very big limitation there are not enough people in this country to sit on the board of 11000 institutions 900 975 universities of the caliber that you would want or anybody in this group would want because in this group is a group of extraordinary institutions who have done very well over the last large large number of years so i would just talk about a, a, a little bit of strategy then answer your question if you don't mind first i think the new new education policy says we want large multidisciplinary universities and colleges autonomous colleges not small institutions second it says yen fragmentation so that every college has at least 3000 or more then there will be graded autonomy and they will be mentored achievement minimum benchmark etc and every college should be autonomous or a university by 2040 so there is a 20 year road map that has been given in the new education policy and i think then they suggested certain governing mechanism for that purpose so my view is very simple before i come to manipal first air city should have a policy for consolidating institutions does india require 11000 or whatever number you regulate because i saw 11000 you know 4 and 1500 engineering colleges is too much the uh, 3 or 4000 mba colleges is too much so we should have a policy for consolidating all the institutions so that two or three institutions can come together under a common management that means institution can be transferred to other trust etc so that there will be fewer number and those fewer number will have an ability to go up to 3000 students over a period of maybe 5 to 8 years so that will create a benchmark so that you can have lesser boards lesser number of people and that will help improve quality and this is also very important because every year 200 300 engineering calls are dying they are very bad and nobody wants to go to them and in india there is a flight to quality you can ask the members here in the last 7 8 years their intake has more or less doubled because everybody wants to go to a good college or a good university private or public they want the brand name and 11000 colleges don't have the brand name maybe 500 600 have a brand name and if you go for a hiring from any other college with that you like the job because they say who are you where are you etc so there has to be a policy for consolidation i think that's very important second thing is i think we should ask all the institution under your uh, you know under your governance to ask them to read the new education policy and come out with a strategic institution development plan a strategic institution development plan where they can write down all the things that the policy wants them to do and the road map for the next 10 years where they will be and that could include a chapter on governance based on the principle enshrined in the new education policy now what are the principles in the new education policy that the board of governance should be independent should be self governing institution free of external interference and they must work on making proper disclosure and they must have a high quality leadership and academic leadership should be separate from governance that means vice chancellor should have full authority under the management to take care of academic matters except you must report to the board on the broad directions and academic excellence given by the board so we should ask them to create a strategic institution plan i think that's a very important component and once the plan comes to everybody comes to aicte well you have to spend some time you can go through that and from that distill some actual principles principles that everybody is following or from all the discussion we are today what has made things work and from that create a code a good good corporate good governance practices a code good governance practices as a let us say a guide for all the institutions to start implementing without being made into a regulation or a rule because there has to be voluntary compliance 
because good governance is a culture good governance is a culture and if you don't have the culture of good governance is not going to work for example in manipal when dr tma pai started a 60 years ago as a medical college and then the engineering institution he made sure he got a very very reputed person to be the first vice chancellor and dr tma pai as the chancellor the head of the institution only focus on making sure there's availability of infrastructure availability of money very clear rules to make sure that if the accounting was proper auditing was proper disclosure was proper and he hired the best professors to come and join and gave them full freedom so the culture of excellence the culture of transparency the culture of the founders making sure they have a arms length between the institution and themselves a culture of not using institutional money for personal purposes was properly done and they also had a guideline that all admissions will be on merit of course in those days there was a need for something called a capitation fee because you know there was no money government did not give money bank didn't give money so parents paid the money and that was fully accounted and they got the seats based upon merit so this process was done and it was so tough that even the son of the chancellor did not get a seat because he did not qualify in the in the you know examination he did not get a seat and dr ramdas pai who succeeded dr tma pai said no and because he said no his own wife refused to speak to him for 15 days you cannot deny your own son of an institution you found a seat because you know he did not pass i don't think anywhere in the country many people have done that so these are the stuff down which are set so my first view is governance is a culture and the culture will only come if the founding team understands what has to be done they are held accountable and they think how to do it otherwise in most places and in very many companies too you will have a board all of them are hand picked no information goes to them they come there they have good meeting they are all good people and they go away and things go on is like a cricket match where there is a match going on in the ground and there are people scoring and between the scoring and the cricket match uh, there is no uh, there is no connection <laughs> scoring happens by itself and the match goes on by itself so it's very important to do that next important thing is like i said earlier you must pick a vice chancellor the process of fixing a vice chancellor has to be a process as an arms length i think the nep has suggested that there should be an independent committee which is the right way it happens in many states except they give a number of 3 and something happens in some states but i think that's a very important process and what we did in manipal let me share some good practices first of all dr tma pai set the norms long ago and he followed the norms and he made sure that he was following it first there were no two set of rules one for others and one for himself then he had good people on the board now who are good people good people are independent minded people strong independent minded people who have a view they are not afraid to articulate the view and they are people who have spent a lifetime in good institutions and we had many many good people like uh, like dr pai panandikar and uh, we had uh, tm tm chennai and tvm chennai etc who were there on the board and they were very independent people and because they independent people in the board meeting there was a lot of discussion and the vice chancellor had to report on all the achievements that was done so you need to have a good board and the board has to be independent people now can you pick up independent people can you do that well let me tell you what infosys does because infosys started practices of corporate governance in this country 20 years ago and they are top class globally recognized top class we had independent people with a nominations committee who chose those people and we made sure they were compensated now like the dr ashok setter said you know people will come on the board they will be on subject to review but you see they're not going to be compensated in university nobody pays you money to spend on a university now if you are on the board of governor university you have to spend a lot of time at least in a month you have to spend one or two days at least in a quarter you have to spend four or five days you have to travel so you got to make sure we made sure that they had good compensation so the best minded people come because their times are all valuable now in university good people they join because it's altruistic they want to do something for society etc but there's a limitation on the time so i think it's very important that we create a proper mechanism to reasonably compensate people not too much a reasonable sitting fee etc which is done in a proper manner and the third like uh, dr shetter said 
we should have a governance norm which says you can be on the board for a certain number of years. Your term will be maybe two terms of five years each. In companies, it is three terms of three years each. And after three years, you will, you will let us say, uh, resign and go because, you know, you will not be renominated. And the third thing, which is very, very, uh, very, very important for governance is on the board, there should be majority of independent people and not people who are related or in any say connected to the founding team or the founders. Now, in the private sector, there are many founders. There should not be more people. For example, if you look at the Kakorkar committee recommendations, Anil Kakorkar headed a committee for recommending governance mechanism and reforms in the IITs. I would urge you to read the report. There is a big chapter on governance. And there we have said very clearly, on the board of governance, we should have majority independent people, less government nominees, when you talk about government nominees for the private sector, less nominees from the founding team or the, or the management team or whatever it is. And there should be room for alumni. Alumni should be there. There should be women on the board. So gender balance is important. The new education policy speaks about gender balancing, both for students, for staff, and for governance. And they must make sure there's a retirement policy so that people don't stay too long. So the majority should be, you know, majority should be people who are very independent. And then, like Dr. Shetter said, the role of the board and the role of the vice chancellor should be clearly demarcated. What should the board do? What should the vice chancellor do? We have done that. And I think there is a document inside. I think we have it there. And the roles are very, very clearly done. So there's no interference. I was the board for a long period of time till uh, UGC came and made some changes. So I am on the trust board. And I could not recommend anybody for a seat. I could recommend whomever came to me to send a note to the vice chancellor, say, please have a look, but they will go strictly by merit. So the role of the board and the role of the academic, academic head has to be very clearly demarcated. And the role can be demarcated to say, the board has oversight over the finances because the finances is a fiduciary responsibility. The board has oversight about budgets because budgeting is a fiduciary responsibility. The board has oversight about capital expenditure. It is a fiduciary responsibility. The board role is to review the work of the university constantly and to make sure the benchmarks and operations are done properly. And the board has a role to recommend members to the board. And the board has a role to make sure that appointments to the vice chancellor, the pro vice chancellor, and one layer below, there is oversight of the board through a committee. That means the vice chancellor, the top functionary, one level below the board, one level below the vice chancellor will go to the board. I think that is important. Then you need a whistleblower policy you need an anti-sexual harassment policy, and then you need a policy for retirement. Even for the academic staff, we need a policy for retirement, just like the board. And like Chetra said, having a review of the performance each board member is important because uh, whenever the term of the board member comes to an end, uh, are normally every one or two years, there'll be a review done by 360 degree mechanism, whereby uh, we make a self-appraisal, and then others make a self-appraisal for everybody through a 360-degree mechanism. Now, all these are laid down in the World Bank, in corporate India, and many other places. So all the demarcation. So I think if we're able to do all this, then the next important point is appointment of faculty. Now, just like students come in on merit, whatever be the merit is open, transparent, and there is no underhand dealings, everything, every money is accounted. Faculty appointment should be on merit. It must be done hands, arm's length, it must be done independently with a maker-checker mechanism. In governance, maker-checker is important. There should be one person who does this, one person who signs off. It cannot be all powers in the hands of one person. For example, if the chairman wants to do something, a board committee will recommend, he will sign off. If the vice chancellor wants to do something, the chairman should sign off as a oversight because it's important to have maker-checker as a matter of internal control for everybody. And the last point I will, I will make sure is each of this, each of this, uh, you know, boards should also have a person for external relations. External relations means relationship with the government, relationship with the director, director I mean, with the, uh, the regulator, and have a compliance committee. Because today the biggest issue is ASCT is the regulator. You got so much. Now, when ASCT wants compliance, sometimes the matters don't go to your board. For example, I'm on the board of MDI, you know, and we have a problem. There's a compliance problem. The board was never informed about the compliance problem. So when we came, so when uh, AICT raised some issue, we were shocked. We were wondering what is happening here because 
there has to be very strict compliance. That means every board meeting, a compliance report has to be given. A compliance report has to be given. And possibly the compliance report, compliance of the regulator can be put on the web page because compliance is extremely important and ensuring compliance is the role of the board. So I will end here by saying we have worked very well because of a culture that is brought in by Dr. TMFI and Dr. Ramdas Pai. And the culture is extremely strong. So everybody follows that. So the thought of doing wrong doesn't come. You have visited them. The thought of doing wrong doesn't come. When the thought of doing wrong doesn't come, you will not do wrong. For example, Dr. Anil Sastabude, he'll never do anything wrong. Why is that? Because the thought of doing wrong will never come to his mind. For some people, the thought of doing right will never come to their mind because that's the way they are built. And you can't change those people. Go bored, no bored, you can't change them. And the only way to change them is to expose to disclosure to public. So there should be a disclosure policy, what they put up on the web. There should be proper reporting to AICT. So that is the culture, the structure, the do's and no's for a long period of time. And I think, you know, you've seen the result. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pai Saab. It means whatever it has been mentioned in new education policy, more than that is being done by Manipal Group. Now, you are quite away from Mangalore. And in Mangalore, as per new education policy, even some university from foreign, among top 100 universities or some 200 universities may come, they can establish their campus there itself in Mangalore. Say. Second one, the target as per this institute of eminence is concerned in time to come in next five years say you'll have to you'll have to figure into some 200 universities of the world what will be change in your governance what will be your plan to compete with these universities which is coming from foreign they may be having better reputation as compared to us there may not be any doubt about that one and second one the target which you'll be achieving for having that that 200 250 rank does the same governance mechanism will work or something new you are planning to do into that one? Well, let me take uh, you know the competition. See, competition is good because it is competition that makes you succeed. Today, 7,50,000 Indians are studying outside India with 2,10,000 in the United States. But in 7,20,000, they're spending $20 billion, 1,50,000 crores a year. That is much more than the budget on higher education by the state governments and the union government, if I'm right. You can check up the data. Why are they going? Now, half of them are going because they are getting very good education with high quality. They go to the maybe top 200, top 500 institutions. Half of them go because they want to emigrate. They want to get jobs. They go to some alto falto college and they do that. That's the reality because everybody, many people want to run away from this country because they think economic prospects are low. Now, when those institutions come here, there's already, today there's already competition. What are the competition? People are going outside and spending money. Now, when they come here, the same people, instead of going outside, they're going to come here. So is competition going to increase? No, competition is not going to increase because there's already so many number of people going. And if all of them come to India, they must offer a degree of the same standing, the same rigor as given in the home country. That should be one of the conditions we must put. No other regulation except to say a foreign university of the top 100 in the world, when you come to India, you can set up, you can operate, you have full freedom, but the degree that you give should be the same quality, same standard, recognized globally as you give in your home country. That should be the only quality. And then give them full freedom that they come because you're going to give freedom. So we are not worried about competition. And I'm, I'm honestly saying that we're not worried about competition because competition is already there and people are coming. Now, second, what do we do to go into the top 200? What we have done for the last six years is we have benchmark ourselves against the Times score, Times University scoring, against the QS and Shanghai Zingzhou. We have, we have benchmark ourselves. And when we benchmark ourselves, we come out quite well in terms of teaching. We don't come out quite well in terms of research. We don't come out quite well in terms of foreign faculty coming here, globalization. We come out quite well in terms of foreign students because we got 3,000 students in Manipal for the medical college who come from all over the world. It is one of the best medical colleges in any university in the world. And in terms of governance, we are right there. So what we have done, we have started a plan over the last many years to increase our funding and our research output. Our research output has gone up about 5x in the last 10 years. So research output is important because in everything, there's a weightage of 25 to 40% for research. Now, that's why the National Research Foundation is important. 
because we need public funding for research. Research cannot be done by fees. Now, if you expect us to do research by fees, it's not going to happen. You can't burden the poor student. The student is paying for teaching. You need research from public institution. So there, you know, there are some of the funding is given by Dr. Ranjan Pai from his own resources because he has other businesses. Some of the funding comes from government. So we train people. We did many things else to increase research, and that is working very well. Next, what we did is we build linkages with multiple universities. We got tied up with a large number of universities. There's a faculty exchange program, there's a student exchange program, etc. And that is very important. And the next thing we did is we made sure that you know we get students from outside in the medical school and partially in the engineering school. The medical school better, better because from there coming from the emerging markets, then we have set up a medical school in Antigua, in the West Indies, outside India, which trains 500 doctors, all white Americans, white Americans for the US, uh, US for the United States. For the education there is extremely high quality, comparable to the United States, and they're coming in large numbers there. So we know what is happening, and they use our education processes to do that. So we want some of them to come to India. So we asked them to come to India, do two years, first two years in medicine in uh, Manipal, and then they go there to do the balance. We do an offshore on-site model just to make sure cost comes down because the first two years are for basic science. So our faculty and our campuses are very, very uh, used to having foreign students. And then what we did, we built world-class infrastructure. One of the problems with many of our institutions is they don't have very good infrastructure because remember, we are a poor country. We are used to bad toilets. We are used to bad grounds. We are used to dirt and muck, etc. Because we live, we don't live in good circumstances. But a foreigner coming is used to a better stuff. Of course, they come from poorer countries than us. They may say, okay, even there, urban areas are much better. So we built very good hostels, air-conditioned hostel, reasonable fee. We built food courts. We have doctors in the campus. We built world-class sports facilities. You would have seen in Manipal that uh, Marena that sports facility, I'm sure you have seen that. It is world class. So we build facility with the same as their home country. Then we benchmark our curriculum to see what happens there. By doing all this, we created a roadmap for the future. The only thing we need now is to get foreign uh, faculty to come and teach, for which we have got Government of India restrictions because they don't allow visas, long-term visas. We have to solve the problem. And second, we need some overseas people on the board, maybe two or three overseas people, which I think we'll do for a period of time. So if we increase our global output of research, if we increase more foreign faculty coming here, other points were quite there. So we have a roadmap for 10 years. So we hope we'll come up there, but it requires a lot of money. And we also need money because, you know, investment in laboratories, investment in physical assets, investment in things requires a lot of money and we don't get enough money. Banks don't give you, banks give you loans, but you know, we have a problem. So I think, this is extremely important that all these things do. So we must ask our top 200 institutions, give us a roadmap how we are going to reach this 200, top 200 for the next 10, 15 years. How are you going to interact? And I would like uh, AICT, Dr. Anil Sasapode and UGC to call the QS people and call the Times people to change the norms. I'll explain to you what is. If I'm in uh, Netherlands, I cross the border 10 kilometers to go to Germany to study I'm a, I'm a foreign student. If I'm in Netherlands as a faculty, I cross the border 15 kilometers, I become a foreign faculty. Whereas in India, because we are a very large country, 1.39 billion people with about 29 states, if a Tamil Nadu student comes to Bangalore, they have come 250 kilometers. It's like going to three countries in Europe. They don't get any credit. They're still an Indian student. So for a large country, this physical distancing and faculty going, the, what is this foreign and all is something that Dr. Sasabude and all of you should take up to make sure they change the rules. I've been talking to them for long because I know many of them and they promised to do that. Of course, the research is something. And the last point there is they also have something which involves the brand of the institution. They have some 10,000 people and we, you got to write to them and ask them, what do you think of Manipal? Not many of them know Manipal overseas. And what they think, the, the, the what they think of Manipal and what they think goes into the ranking and that's why all of us come low. IITs are known globally because the brand. Manipal is known a little bit more. Others who want to go to the ranking will not be done. So we require branding globally. And for branding globally, through the regulator, we want better interaction with more professors of overseas to come here, giving them you know, uh, professorships here. We need some funding from the government. And then we need, we also need internships. 
a mobilization of internship from all the universities. So there will be a student exchange program. For that, some funding as part of the new as a part of the new education policy is required because the mandate is you got to be in the top 200 if you want to be in the top 200 you need that kind of a funding to build the brand which i request uh, regulators like aict and others to give to put in some mechanism either under their auspices or give us some funding to do that if you do all that there is good hope that they will come is important what culture institute is having then as per you competition is good in fact competitions give strength that's again again very good and you want from ugc ict they should be more enabler now in time to come if financial yes. help and support if it can be extended that's that's the requirement i mean we want to be like uh, aict under anil sasabude the last four yeah. years what doc has done is remarkable unbelievable work is done i mean the problem with aict and what you have done is institutions still don't believe what you have done because every time you go to Dr. Anil Sastra, say, give an autonomy. He said, Raja Bhaiya, sab kuch diya hai, le lo, aur kya chahiye. And if you look at what he has done, everything is there. I think, you know, this culture should be there for the next five, ten years. So, for next ten minutes, Honorable Chairman, Sir, uh, Professor Anil Sastra Budeji is connected. Sir, sir, some questions from you, Honorable Chairman, Sir. You were in IIT, Guwahati. You entered into College of Engineering Pune in 2004. It was just only government college. No academic autonomy, no financial autonomy, no governance structure, no administrative freedom. Uh, faculty was transferable, even I think staff may also be transferable. No ownership, no drive, poor work culture, almost no powers, but high expectations. Yes, expectations were certainly very high. When you came out, when you came out, Probably it is in 2013. 13 you came out. That time, shape and, and face of the, the, the COP was something different. What exactly you have done, sir? And whatever you had, the governance mechanism you had, your leadership you had, do you think whatever you have done, the same is getting reflected now in new education policy? Or education policy is more than that, what exactly you have done? Or it is less, some more it has to be added in new education policy. So more institutes, just like College of Engineering Pune, can be in our country. Not only one College of Engineering Pune, there may be hundreds of College of Engineering Pune, it should be. So what are those gaps which you have filled, what is lacking now still in new education policy? Uh, thank you, Puneji. I thought uh, I will speak at the end because there are some more speakers still lined up. Uh, but since you have raised, uh, you thought probably I am going out. Well, my convocation address is over in NIT Manipur. So I, uh, I kept on the video, but audio is off and I can be listening to this uh, dialogue which is going on. I missed actually a major part of Ashok Shatter, uh, who is my good friend and also compatriot in uh, the good governance model of the TechWay project. Uh, but uh, Mohan Daspai, more or less, I heard completely. And I agree with him in all the points. Actually, he's wonderful in terms of uh, articulating what is necessary and needed. But I will take off from what he said, one or two sentences, and then come back to College of Engineering. Point. He said, good governance is a culture, you know, very important statement. But I'm saying that it is a agriculture. It is agriculture because culture is connected with agriculture. You may say, what is this? But in a lighter way, Yes, agriculture and culture are connected, but I will tell you, the agriculture talks about sowing the seeds and the seeds then sprout into a plant. And if you don't put the right seeds, I think what comes out is going to be the same seed, you know, DNA same, you know, and therefore if you plant a mango seed, you will get mango plant and mango fruits. And therefore that culture of uh, uh, what you say, governance, good governance with TMA Pi, you know, wonderful personality and that ethics, morals is very, very significant and important. And that is what was necessary in all the institutions. Wherever that has happened, these institutions have succeeded for a long time. In fact, spoiling an institution is also difficult. And bringing out a bad institute into a good one is also difficult. You know, both are difficult. I keep often saying that it, it is the Newton's uh, law which acts actually. For any, you know, the body is in continuous to be in motion unless acted upon by force. 
this force can be positive or negative so if a institute is running well a bad director also cannot spoil it so easily it takes 10 years to spoil it and a and a bad institute to convert it into good it takes 10 years and that is where coef we had to do it uh, so i am again giving an example of iit kanpur the founding director who was kelkar you know kelkar so such a seed there and that institute remained as the top institute nearly for 40 50 years it's only recently that bombay and delhi have taken over otherwise kanpur used to be number one iit when i was a student and all along because of the seats that were sold i think with that i will come to the the experience of uh, especially college of engineering pune and uh, where the politics and interference was kept at arms length which again mohan das uh, repeatedly said because of dr fc kohli the chairman of the board of governors i think that was most important when he invited me from iit guwahati to lead college of engineering pune as director he first told the minister there that if at all if some direction is to be given if you have some suggestion you tell me and i will in turn tell the director you have no business to talk to my director you know that kind of isolation i think no one can do it other than probably dr fc kohli and that is one important thing which happened so no interference of what whatever kind secondly uh, i being from outside you know that is another important thing for leadership person who is from that very institution should not lead the institution if you get someone from outside naturally you are on deputation and you are always you can pack off your bag and go and you are not worried about uh, the the uh, outcome and that gives further strength to you i think that those are the two great strengths the third one and uh, again very importantly the approach should be the bottom up approach if you want to take the institute which is in the very bad shape to a higher level all stakeholders whether it is students whether faculty the support staff alumni the industry all of them have to be taken on board and that can only be done by having lots of uh, deliberations discussions and forming the team in terms of uh, vision mission goal setting all of that has to be done in meetings after meetings on holidays full day of discussion lot of games i think you you create a culture that all of us are having the same common idea you know that is what is to be sown into the minds of everyone otherwise always you you look at a, most of the professors uh, professors means i'm talking about faculty if they are a lecturer or assistant professor they will always be keeping on cribbing that mera promotion nahi hua associate professor abhi associate professor will think professor nahi hua professor will think mera hod nahi hua dean nahi hua ye principal baith gaya hai mera principal kab aayega see i think this is what most of the people will always have in the mind but how do you take them on board comes from a, a sort of exercise where everyone will start deliberating on this swot analysis of the institution what are the strengths what are the the, the weaknesses what are the opportunities what are the threats if everyone is on the same page then you challenge say that if we have all agreed to this vision and mission how do we achieve it then give the responsibility to them don't give task to them you say that what will you do out of this we have decided 10 goals where do you contribute so each one will then start saying that i will contribute in research i will contribute in becoming a best teacher i will say someone who is interested in sports i will uh, uh, you know take up the activity of sports or ncc i think each one have their own talent own uh, uh, what you say interest if you allow them to do that and that's why our standard uh, acr form where you say that everything everyone will have same equal weightage i think we should give away with that we should give freedom and each faculty will decide on his own at the beginning of the year we did that actually and that changes the where, where whole work culture of the faculty members okay some minimum is required so i can't say that i will not do teaching at all because i am still faculty member i will keep on doing sports activities in the institute you are not a sports instructor so i think you will have to do your teaching activity so weightage can be less you have some 15 to 20% weightage for teaching research and administration and then say that remaining 60 points uh, after that whatever 40 points are remaining you distribute wherever you like you put it in research basket you put it in teaching basket you teach it in administration basket and do it well uh, and then if you evaluate a faculty member and we know because the law of averages 
not everyone is interested in research not everyone is interested in uh, in teaching not everyone is interested in administration so each one will pick up that which he, he is interested in and everyone will perform and overall institute will perform well and that is where our ranking will improve i think that is the magic formula which was uh, used which uh, took certainly 9 years to come to a stage from not even appearing within the 50th uh, rank within the national level uh, various rankings to within top 10 20 uh, it becomes a very very difficult task but it it was able to be done i think that is most important thing and uh, if uh, uh, ashok shetter ji remembers both uh, vvb college of engineering and coep was selected by techwip project npiu as the two best governed institutions in the country uh, thank you uh-huh. that whole activity and you, we remember that green book a uh, good yeah yeah, yeah. Good <laughs> governance green, green book famous green book it was <laughs> famous green book and when yeah. we were filling sometimes even after having gone through iit for 9 years 10 years uh, uh, my experience of 11 years in a new iit indian institute of science masters and phd some of the things we were still not understanding let us be honest and, and then one of the things was you have to maintain a register of interest so what is this interest what what interest do we have we don't have we have only interest in academics no 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 where the conflict will arise has to be very clearly enunciated that is what is done in a company law you know you know com- companies board of directors are required to give what are their interests the interest in the sense that will there be any possible conflict of interest and thereby if you are associated with some interviews or some activity and if you are some uh, uh, related institute is coming in or university is coming in you have to withdraw from decision making at that time actually that is why the register of interest is to be maintained so we took nearly one or two years to understand what is that uh, understand <laughs> understand that uh, uh, what is that interest you know that is how there are many things and board of governors is is a activity again i remember kohli ji who says even in big companies you know corporate world there are quarterly meetings and uh, a big agenda is given about 10 days before 300 400 pages hardly uh, most of the board of directors have time to read all of that they come there in the meeting take a sitting fee uh, give some suggestions here and there and can move on but in an academic institute if someone is wanting to become a member or a chairman even an ordinary member he must be committed to give time beyond that quarterly meeting 2 hours 3 hours and that is what is significant how do i contribute to that institution in whatever expertise i have if uh, mohan das pai is financial expert he should be able to take care of finances of the institution if someone is an academic institution uh, you know head earlier director of an iit or someone is in, on the board we should look at what is the curriculum how it is driven how teaching learning processes can be improved and so on and if someone has some other uh, you know interest they must contribute and that contribution is what is known as 100 hours per year you know that is the formula kohli ji said if you are not ready to give 100 hours beyond the, that four quarterly meetings you have no role no business to be on the board of governors of an institution i think all of our people on the board whether it was professor dhande who was on the board professor sonde who was on the board anand khandekar who was on the board each one of them were committed to give 100 100 hours pratapra pawar kohli himself i think all of these guys uh, gave their time i think that is a most important thing and it should be uh, what we say in many uh, languages it should be all inclusive uh, board of governors should have women certainly women we must have some uh, physically challenged that is divyanga we should have some alumni we should have first generation learner first generation one who has got into education we must also have some student member because we get some in- insights from student community which we are never able to understand i think these are some of the facets if you are able to do that which we did we are able to succeed and uh, mohan das ji i think some of the things which ministry is already doing some of us do not publicize therefore you do not know you rightly pointed out that we must have good engagement with the foreign uh, faculty we have a program which is running for last 3 years called gan the global initiative of academic networks where faculty from abroad are invited and they come to india for one week or two week and state of the art course which they teach there they teach it for one or two weeks here exactly like isb model you know faculty come and go you know and they take one full course so like this course is driven 
and more than nearly 3,000 faculty have come in the last two, two and a half years. I think this is a phenomenal change where faculty coming from abroad will get interaction with our students, our faculty, and they will know our strengths. And only then they will be in a position to, in the peer review, which is some points which are there in the ranking, they will talk about Indian institutions, because otherwise they don't know Indian institutions. But unfortunately, in the beginning, government only restricted initially to only IITs and some central universities, then gradually added other government colleges. Now, gradually, they are, uh, the government is also talking about giving this facility to even private institutions. So from day one, it should have been allowed for private institutions as well. I think this is one. Similarly, Spark. Spark is a research uh, proposal which are invited where, without having a partner institution from abroad, a faculty from another university abroad, the project proposal is not accepted at all. So you are forced to do collaboration. I think joint degree programs. These are the areas from where we will start getting foreign students, foreign faculty, even for short term, maybe a semester or two. And all institutions of eminence are allowed to take even permanent faculty for foreign faculty. I think these are the baby steps which have been already taken. And our new national education policy has all of these facets and many more. So whatever we experimented in uh, maybe in IIT or in uh, College of Engineering Pune or I am doing now in AICTE is only uh, tip of the iceberg. Many facets which have been talked about in the new national education policy, if utilized fully directly with a thorough uh, strategy and implementation plan, the time is not uh, going to be uh, of the essence within a matter of four or five years. We will be, we must be in a position to have some of our institutions appearing in the 100 rankings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. And five things I'm, I'm taking away from uh, taking uh, from your, your this uh, conversation. First of all, the benchmarking which you have done, you are done with IIT Mumbai, Bombay. So great leader is that one whose dreams are high. And then only if he is working according to that one, then he can achieve. Second thing, sir, which we people are observing when we are working with you, you are not taking anything lightly. With, with, with seriousness, whatever the, 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 the quantum of responsibility, it may be maybe a small job, maybe a bigger job, you are doing with same level of responsibility to that one. And third one, even at 8 p.m. in your office, you never say, I am exhausted. The, 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 the best leader is that one. Who is never exhausted he is never tired his face is smiling he's energetic always uh, working the way he's working at 9 a.m in the morning and good human being that is also a very very strong trait which you are having then another thing which you have created in in, in uh, coap pune that is very important you said taking um, i mean at high level to bad institute that is also difficult and from good institute making them bad institute that it's, itself is also difficult i'm saying sir third issue you have brought that institute at its peak and and in 2014 uh, 15 year left sir that institute and it is 2020 even if it is running at the same pace during last five years that itself is a contribution otherwise it is a, it's a individual dependent and the, the, this mechanism we are having the system which we are having it is person dependent if person is not there even if it is working at the same pace it means the system which you have created it is stable and it will work for years so that's again one beauty of a leader that whatever he is doing he is doing for years wonderful sir will be again will be coming to you in between uh, professor tiwari is with us mk tiwari sir just I was going through one uh, address of Ratan Tata Ji. He has given this address in 2006 in some institute of management. He told there one story. One person has gone to purchase one parrot. In a shop he has gone. That shop was made for the parrots in fact. So one, one parrot he said, I'll, I want to take this parrot. How much you'll be charging from that owner? He has asked. He said, 5,000 I'll, I'll charge for this parrot. That person said, it's very costly. Why 5,000? What is the beauty of this parrot? He said, sir, it can it can write with its beak in English language. Whatever you say, this parrot will be writing in English. So in that language, it's good. And even the typing is also very good. 
so he said for another one second one you please tell me what what how much will be charging this one it's very costly he said it's its price is 10000 rupees he said why why 10000 that one was to 5000 next one you are charging 10000 he said it can write in three languages not only in english it's very strong in three languages it can write finally he said for third one how much you can charge for this one 10000 5000 buying very capacity is not there so for third one he said 30000 so he was surprised not 5000 10000 why 30000 then that owner said i don't know what capabilities this parrot is having but everyone who is around in this vicinity all the parrots they are saying principal sir to this this parrot everyone is saying principal sir principal sir principal sir but i don't know what capabilities what capacities it is having aap meeting mumbai mein aaye hain one is principal sir due to its abilities everyone is saying principal sir second one even if someone is not capable again he can become principal sir that that mechanism in our country we are having so many many adults in type of institutes where where tiwari sir we are working and new education policy is saying whole sort of autonomy will be having financial administrative academic every sort of autonomy will be having the 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 Place where you are working and the autonomy which you are enjoying and autonomy which any be say, do you find any difference? And the principal sir, the word principal sir, is it prominent there also? It is due to the capabilities or it is due to the the, the person some safaris or something people are coming. What are your observations and how this entity from today itself we want to implement in what way we can implement for making this governance system and this leadership a transparent and dedicated leaders can can enter into our system. So Kunia ji, first of all. i sincerely thank you icit for giving me this chance and professor anil ji and you uh, to have this uh, participation in the webinar in, uh, in presence of so many eminent people so what i can say uh, i thought that uh, i will come out of with a plan and uh, apply the principles of project management that how the nep is going to be implemented and accordingly we have burned some uh, hours on that and came out of with the principles uh, which are enunciated in the uh, guide books of implementing good policy like how to divide the whole task into the different types of projects and sub task and accordingly schedule them to achieve the target so with that sort of things even i made a presentation also to a uh, whole group that okay how it can be done in the 5 year or 4 year time or 10 years time but since your question is entirely different that how this uh, autonomy and other things are given to the other institutions and where we are liking so i let me tell you uh, niti mumbai sir it's a very old institute it started in 1963 and uh, it was aimed to provide education to the people who are working in the different companies and empowering them to have the more knowledge of the productivity but later on we started very flagship program post graduate diploma in the industrial engineering uh, and that program became so successful that after the abc or in the line of abc our program was so popular and still i tell you neet is the only institution professor punnia and others i want to cite where the highest gate merit is coming up 99.9 99.7 from the rest of the institutions and uh, we are also having blessed with the company's presence here that they used to come and take the voyage and also we are encouraging them to become the entrepreneurs uh, in days to come up in line with the uh, rest of the country's policy so and also we take the student from the cat and that to also very high merit around uh, that automatically comes so that way neet is blessed with a very good standards of the inputs that we are getting from rest of the india and uh, hope that Uh, this uh, trend will continue uh, and also we follow the entire systems of the ict that they suggest particularly maintaining the standards seat arrangements etc but sir we are not that autonomous like iim sir iit is actually so we are restricted say for example recent example i want to cite uh, i have to uh, announce my admission schedule and in that schedule actually we have to follow the uh, our own guideline but later on we told that we have to follow the schedule given by the ugc 
So accordingly, even our seats were also vacant, but we paid the money to entire students, just only to honor the guidelines of our uh, regulatory ICT. And I can challenge, challenge that you can go in no, none I am. They have followed any guidelines given by you. So idea is that, sir, we have uh, limitations of many things, including that we do, uh, our boards are also decided by the government and everything. And uh, But we are proud to say that enough ministry is helping to us. They are doing everything for the needy. They are giving full financial support to us. And uh, that way we are blessed to have a full support from the MHRD and hope that in all respect that we will do very well in the history of One part is this one. Second one, I'm saying to Sahab, you are having name of government of India in your institute and that may be one of the reasons why quality students are getting attracted. That, that may be one of the reasons I'm saying because government of India name is there. If I'm combining this one, name of India as well as autonomy which has been extended to Vice Chancellor of Manipal University. If that sort of autonomy you, if you are enjoying and name of the government of India is with you, then probably, probably the speed and pace of the development of the institute will be something different. Certainly. What are, what are your views on this one? My view is that, as you said, that we are also thinking that uh, if we get this kind of autonomy that we have our own board member uh, with guidelines that these are the people uh, who should have commitment and then what Professor Anil told that uh, Professor Kohli ins uh, insisted this many number of hours, even 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 all those things, if we can combine, I tell you, it will be one of the top ranking uh, industrial engineering and business school in the, not only in India, but in most of parts of the world. Because already you can see, we are just uh, in the top 12 uh, at present, but I'm very sure the kind of move we are taking, like say, we were the first to conduct the online examination despite all kind of hindrances in the country. And similarly, online admissions also we have done in the country. So you give us freedom, I tell you, we will do everything which can take us to the next level that is equivalent to many of the best institutions, not only in India, but also in the world. Very good. Uh, Chaturvedi sir, we are having around 350 PGDM institutes in the country and very special type of model. Earlier in IAMs, this type of model was, now IAM is having a different type of structure and different type of degrees they may they are giving. But PGDM institutes are autonomous. No adult from university side, no adult from when examination it has to be conducted, who will be setting the question paper. Every sort of autonomy you people are having, even financial autonomy, administrative autonomy, every sort of autonomy, it is there. And now the, the governance model also, um, um, AICT has proposed one model, governance model also. What are your views? In what way is governing structure of institutes of um, management, management, the PDM institutes, it has to be? And do you think whatever autonomy it is being expected in new education policy, the graded autonomy already be started in PGDM institutes? What exactly lacking as per new education policy, what it has to be? there in our policy document so most of the pgm institute can achieve that target or the name which i am for having or i am sar having what exactly that gap is so uh, first of all i congratulate uh, chairman and vice chairman of aict to initiate uh, uh, six uh, seven uh, brainstorming sessions and uh, today I have got this opportunity. I am so much enlightened by listening my earlier speakers and so intervention made by the ICT chairman. Regarding the PGDM institutions, I would like to say that there has been a mixed uh, performance on the parameters of governance, leadership and autonomy because PGDM institutions were given autonomy uh, parallelly to IIM institution. IIMs were granting diploma and PGDM institutions were also granting diploma. And uh, it has helped uh, very well to this model of management education. And I can say, uh, based on my experience of last 20 years, that most of the rankings if you check the top 100 rankings, 
you will find that 70-80% uh, rankings are occupied by PGDM institutions rather than affiliated programs which are called MBA. But after a change in the IM model uh, by passing an act in the parliament, now are offering a degree, uh, MBA degree as well as the PhD degree. So this advantage of having uh, a level playing field with IM is no more available with PGDM institutions. Of course, there are good PGDM institutions and not so good PGDM institutions. And the region may be various regions. And I know that uh, the location, governance, uh, available resources, infrastructure, branding, so many parameters which are helping or, or not making a PGDM institution a good B school. But overall, I would like to say that uh, the governance, leadership, and autonomy are interlinked. We cannot imagine one without two others. Experience of last 73 years after independence speak very clearly that if a leader is good, he or she can create good governance. If autonomy is given, then it can help in blossoming of governance as well as leadership. It has been proved by many IAMs and even many private self-financed PGDM institutions. And I would like to say that this model of autonomous management institute in our country was envisioned none other than by one of the greatest scientists of our country, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, in his 60s when he has prepared a blueprint for management education in our country. There was only one model that the new institution should be part of a university or they should be made a university. But was the reason that he, he proposed autonomous management institute without interference of the government and totally under the control of the board of governors and the faculty. And here I would like to mention the name of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the first full-time director who was invited in 1965 by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai to lead the first uh, I am in our country. And he has created a leadership model. And I have uh, tried to uh, read a lot about his leadership model and the way he has uh, uh, nurtured I am Ahmedabad after taking his retirement completing a first tenure of six years, he continued as a professor and allowed others to become the director. So I think there are many good features uh, associated with the growth of IAMs. IAMs have not become a brand within five years or 10 years. It has taken more than 50 years and the leadership linkages between governance, leadership and autonomy. Even the board of governors in IAM Ahmedabad or other leading IAMs were selected by government of India, those who were well known, renowned industrialists or public sector executives or the public figures. And now we are talking about uh, connecting liberal arts with engineering and management education and multidisciplinarity. I think the founders of IAMS, they were very clear and they have encouraged that students from any discipline can join management and many dancers, sports persons, many uh, NGO activists have joined IAMs and they have pursued management education. But here I would like to uh, put a, a, a sounding board that next 20 years will prove our commitment and credibility to governance in academic institutions. Whatever is the current state of affairs, under the institutions are uh, supervised by AICTE or UGC, but next 20 years we have to implement the aspiration, aspirational code given by the, the Dr. Kasturi Rangan committee, which has been given on clause 19, that within 20 years we have to create independent boards for all 
educational institutions. So here I conclude by saying, in response to the question raised by Dr. Punia, that PG, PGDM institutions are not at similar level of development. Many of them have grown and they are doing good, but some of them are suffering because of so many reasons. One of the reason may be uh, poor governance, although I appreciate that a model governance structure for management institutions, institutions which are in a standalone model has been given by the AICT in 2018. This model has worked very well with all leading institutions. We liked it because AICT has involved IMA, AIMS, and EPSI while developing this model. So I think uh, others who are not at the level of uh, other top institutions, those PGDM institutions will have to look and introspect what went wrong, why they are not growing. And if they are not growing, definitely uh, uh, they are they are not uh, going to survive in the future. Future will be more ruthless because when 20 years we are going to implement new education policy, there will be many disruptive changes like Corona or, or the impact of disruptive technology and only excellent institutions will survive. Only institutions with good governance will survive and good governance will be linked with good leadership and good autonomy. are also there which is affecting the progress which is which is making the institute to progress there is no doubt about this one sir and and as per your inputs you are happy with the, the, the type of autonomy which has been extended by AICT to all PGDM institutes the purpose of this today's meeting is basically in new education policy certain suggestions are there we will have to give a concrete um, a concrete document to you in the MHRD that how these proposals which have been written in new education policy, how it will be implemented on ground, how it will be. That's a vision document we will have to give that the, the how execution of this vision document it has to be in, in near, near future. Some of the initiatives which government of India has taken even before coming this new education policy, one for leadership development, there is a LEAP program and under that LEAP program, uh, 21 days rigorous training is being given by our our prominent institutes of the country including IAMS. then for some time the, the participants are going outside india also with whom those academic institutes are having tie-ups also aict is having one tie-up with uk india education research initiative which is we are having with british council under that one as on date uh, i mean during last three years around 600 our academic I mean, teachers, they have been imparted this sort of training. Then high level of modules, we, 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 we are creating online modules so that leadership capabilities of the teachers can be built up. In new education policy, it is written that BOZ will be having power to select head of the institutions. BOZ will be free of any external interferences. New uh, regulations defining powers of boz suppressing all earlier decisions which has been taken so new regulations will be there there will be a new policy new powers will be defined in in boz um, uh, like this one just like our our um, model which you are given similar models may be through this new education policy it will be coming even members of boz will be identified identified by a committee equity consideration also be and role will be very very important um, of board of governors and governors because by 2025 every institute has to become autonomous and this autonomy they let to do justice with that autonomy with us uh, professor imansu rai director i am indoor is with us probably whatever it is mentioned into this new education policy all sort of and uh, this uh, autonomy or all sort of powers are being enjoyed by board of governors of IAMS. Sir, that is one part that autonomy which has been given and how the IAMS are enjoying that autonomy. And now AICT is say developing some 500, 600 leaders, but we are having 10,000 plus technical institutes in the country, at least as on day 10,000 good leaders we need. How IAMS can play an important role in, in developing, in grooming those sort of academicians who can do justice with leadership, responsibility, if it is given to them. Professor Roy. Right, thank you so much. And uh, since I mentioned that I have another meeting at four, I'm going to keep it very, very short. 
uh, in the next three to four minutes, I'm going to share my views on this particular question that you asked. Uh, to begin with, I think IIMs, by and large, and Mia Kalpa, uh, we are equally guilty of that. We don't think we have, uh, I, I don't think we have done enough to address these issues, which are related to actually doing something for the community. And therefore, I believe there are two, three things. One of the things that IIMs need to do is to start mentoring other institutions beyond the smaller and the younger IIMs. So traditionally, we have actually mentored the younger IIMs, but now I think we can be on the advisory boards. My faculty colleagues can be on the advisory boards on other institutions. Uh, like Mr. Mohandas Pai also suggested that uh, all the institutions do not need to have a board. So perhaps five, six institutions can have a common board and we can have the faculty members of IIM sitting over there. Likewise, I would love to have people from other institutions, say the, the, the tier two and the tier three institutions coming over to IIM, not just for a training, but just to say, attend the class just to sit and see as to how does the faculty teach to start some collaborative research. So just like we in our bid to become international and to come top 100, what we at Iron Indoor are doing, uh, we are collaborating with a lot of business institutions across the world, top business institutions, and we invite their faculty to come and stay with us under something called a scholar in residence program, where they come and they don't have to necessarily teach, they just come they talk to our faculty, they conduct some kind of seminar with our PhD students, they sit with our faculty, they just go and talk to the students and not necessarily teach an entire course. That mere exchange of ideas I have found that to be so useful that I think this is something that the other institutions can do. That is number one. Number two, I think one of the reasons why IIMs have done very well, and in particular, I'll speak about IIM Indore, is that we have had a very powerful mission statement which drives us. So, for example, if you look at the mission statement of IIM Indore, it talks about three elements. One, that it is going to be contextually relevant. And what it means is that the kind of programs that we are going to offer, within those programs, the kind of courses that we are going to offer are going to be contextually relevant in the light of the requirements of the post fourth industrial revolution world. The second thing that we say is we are going to be world class in terms of our academic standards. So I'm in Dor, got the triple crown accreditation of AMBA, AACSB and uh, uh, EQUIS last year itself. And we are amongst the top 100 colleges in the world to have that kind of an accreditation. So once again, we can actually help the other institutes come up with a mission statement. And those mission statements have to be in line with what our nation requires. Mr. Pai spoke a very important thing about culture. You see the difference between a country and a nation. A country consists of sovereignty, people, and a landmass. But if you have to make a nation out of a country, what you need is culture, Sanskriti. And likewise, if you want to make an institution out of a college, what you need to have is a culture, and that is a culture of excellence. And that is a culture of inclusiveness. So the third element that I am Indore has in its mission statement is that we are going to be a socially conscious institution. And therefore, what we have to realize is that as IIMs, now we, what did we do to become socially conscious? We know that 833 million people of India live in the rural areas. So we created a program called the Rural Engagement Program, where all my students go and live in villages across Madhya Pradesh, 106 villages. They live there for a week. And then they look at the problems that the people in the rural India face. They suggest solutions, and then they own up to those solutions, implementing them with the help of the state and the district administration. So what IIMs can do and what I would be willing to do, I would. Uh, uh, this is my invitation to all of the institutions who are listening to me today. We would love to help you in formulating your mission statement. We would love to help you in making sure that your mission statement and subsequently whatever you do is in line with what India is going to need in the next five to 10 years. And we are, we are willing to help you with all our courses. In fact, I have asked my dean of uh, academic programs to put all the courses that we have with our, all our details, with all the details on our website. But any institution who requires the details, what do we teach? How do we teach it? What are the case studies that we use? What is the case material that we use? We are willing to share that with any institution who would want that. 
and particularly to answer one specific question, what we are also planning to do, and I think uh, I would request all the IM directors to do this, is to start a program on leadership for people and faculty who are actually going to take up leadership positions. So I come from, I'm an alumnus of KREC Suratkal, and I'm Ahmedabad. And my dean at KREC Sivatkal came to me and said, Himanshu, you need to do this because when our faculty, when we make them deans or even HODs, we know engineering, but we don't know how to handle people. And I said, of course, I'll do that gladly. So we are developing a faculty development program and a leadership program for those faculty who are going to take up the positions of HODs, deans, directors, etc. And I think we will create an ecosystem where we bring in that culture of excellence in the other institutions as well. So once I think all of this is available out there, once people get to know the initiatives that we are taking and we would have to work uh, along with AICTE uh, to mentor and handhold these institutions so that they can implement their mission statements developed in coordination with us. Very good. Thank you, Professor Rai. And for everyone, everyone is ready to extend their expertise for creating their vision mission statement and how it has to be achieved wonderful. It will be a wonderful help to every institute because they are they are having expertise in this area. Uh, Professor uh, Setter, sir, everywhere you are writing in, in BVP model that implementation of quality management system what is that quality management system and how it has to be implemented? What exactly you mean for this implementation of quality management system? Okay. Uh, quality management system starts with your intent. I mean, what's the kind of goal you want to reach uh, in academics? Okay. Uh, in student services in support systems okay so always quality management is uh, driven by the outcomes you desire uh, whether it is academic delivery student support or student services so how exactly you align your resources so that you are able to give out your best okay and at the same time you are able to measure the impact of it. It is not just the intent. You do something, you, you plan something, you act according to it. Okay. But ultimately, what is the impact? What is that you learn from it so that you can further uh, improve? So quality management system is not a one time thing. Okay. It is a continuous process wherein uh, you set your goals, you develop uh, uh, plans through strategic thinking, you implement them, but at the same time measure its effectiveness, use the data to improve further. This is what the quality management system is. Okay, uh, And uh, most importantly in quality management system, it is essential that leader aligns everyone in the system towards these goals. It is not just the goal of the leader, it is the goal of everyone within the institution to work towards those goals. That is uh, then only any uh, uh, quality management system uh, will succeed. And uh, most importantly, in these quality management systems, external audit is very important. It is not just our own perception. It is also a kind of external audit should be happening, which tells us what our strong points are and weaknesses. Uh, another question, sir. The, the new education policy which we are having, it is I mean, school education, higher education. School education will be now for 15 years and the whole sort of curriculum will change in school education. There will be a component of vocational education. There will be a component of this multidisciplinary learning of the, the students. The assessment system will be different. But those students will be coming, suppose tomorrow someone is entering into this education at the age of three. They'll be coming in front of us in higher education after 15 years. That product, according to new education policy, is entering into school tomorrow. After 15 years, they'll be coming to us. 
but because countries needs are something different they need quality manpower they need quality human resource so during these 15 years the dream of this new education policy will be fulfilled only when that product will be after 19 years will be going out 15 after 15 years he'll be entering into higher education after 19 years he'll be going out so first product which will be getting that will be after 19 years as per the grooming of this new education policy what sort of action will it have during these 19 years shall we wait for 19 years or some new measures from our side some proactive role of teachers and management and governance it has to be what exactly in between it has to be done uh, definitely we can't wait for uh, the right uh, stuff to come in like i mean we can't wait for 19 years word is moving very fast wherever we are we have to ensure that okay the new world demands new world requirement is uh, uh, brought into our education system whether i am in a uh, degree education or in a school i can't wait for 15 years to change uh, uh, the scenario. So that's the first thing. Uh, thing is that we need to think whatever students are coming to us at this point of time, are we giving them the best? Or there is an opportunity for us to do better with them. Okay. So uh, you see, uh, our experience tells that, I mean, whatever experimentation we are doing uh, at first year level, at the freshman level in engineering, okay, when we introduced uh, uh, different type of courses like engineering explosion, social innovation, okay, we could see that what my students earlier used to achieve at third year, my first year students were able to raise up to that level of technical competency to that level of problem solving so i don't think we have at this point of time we have fully utilized or fully challenged the potential of our students there is a lot of uh, opportunity for us to improve uh, because we have stuck with a very traditional model the traditional model probably which we have continued from last 50 60 years uh, i mean today's uh, uh, learner is very different so we need to know how today's learner is different how i can use different mediums to uh, really engage him and make him achieve much more so i don't say that we have to wait for 15 years with whatever input we are getting, we can achieve much more. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mondas Pai Sahib. In, in your institute, you are having medical uh, education. We discuss it based on each category and how to take the lowest uh, you know, level of schools to some acceptable level. So I think that should be, that's where technology and other things can come into play because you know the digital divide is very very large now, we might not be aware but Rukmini, i'm sure knows about it a lot it's very very high scholastic achievements is very variant within the top schools and the bottom schools so india has got a huge huge problem maybe we should address that too. my uh spice up in addition to this one my question is your uh, and the, the system of education which you are having in that case there is medical education there is engineering education there is management education all sort of education our medical education is for five and a half years our engineering education is for four years management pg level it is for two years it is in general in general the perception which we are having or it is true also that our doctors are doing far far better even at global level as compared to our engineering graduates and one of the reason is that in medical education there is a concept of, of hospital with academic institute morning time the, the students are studying their academic content if they are um, 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 tackling the, the, the patients with latest disease they are tackling and longer duration the, the, the exposure is for longer duration five and a half years 
engineering education earlier we were having for 5 years after class 11th means 11 year schooling that there was a concept of 5 years engineering now it is for 4 years and even when we are having 4 years acceptance of our engineering graduates are less as compared to medical graduates the duration is lesser now in new education policy it has been reduced to 3 years fourth year will be will be an option if someone is entering into this research this this uh, target or a research career then only fourth year will be now first of all the duration it has been reduced second one up to class 12 there won't be any compartment compartment means no separate mathematics no separate biology no separate commerce no separate um, arts like this one there will be a concept of multidisciplinary subjects and one demand in engineering education is the students who are coming into this engineering education mathematically they should be strong probably there may be chances we don't know what fin final and the, this this decision will be even there are chances that some of these friends who are very good in music or dance like this one and when they will be coming into college they will say sir we want engineering education so it can also be a challenge because they may not be having that much in depth knowledge of mathematics also so duration is less the the, the subjects will be different so do you think now planning part of our institute our pedagogy is our learning i mean capabilities of the our teaching capabilities of the, the teachers the, the learning tools which we are having do you think some mechanism of change also it has to be in align with new education policy it is not necessarily that whatever we, we were doing it will be same whatever the policy it may be what your 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 perception is that in what way those changes will be happening into our institutes you're asking me yes sir you know my see uh, my my view is, is simple the new education policy is a framework a set of high level principles now as a regulator you must allow us to start implementing it right now as we well say multi display universities you know can we start other courses along with it we should allow us to do that second full freedom and autonomy for the curriculum yes you have a best in class curriculum as a guide but give us that so that we can do that and third the flexibility in credits etc for the student you know we want the flexibility right now and then doing credits outside online offline education give us all the flexibility but you know the product that comes out in the next 5 years could be very different from the product that comes out today because they will be put to 4 years we don't have to wait for 19 years for the foundation to come up we could intervene at different levels and i think that will be that will be very very good to do and i think that will work extremely well so it is uh, important that we start this reform movement by giving autonomy everything right now from the next year in fact i requested dr anil sastapude that uh, we should have a curriculum change and everything from the next year so if uh, many of the top 200 institutions give plans we should allow them the freedom to do that that's point number 1 and uh, point number 2 about those four years I don't think the new education policy restricts professional courses and puts them into a straight jacket of three plus one. I don't think so, because I think the professional courses there's a separate chapter which says that they will be governed differently. So we could have a four-year with twelve plus four is quite okay. And the next thing which is very important is, you know, we should allow more, uh, you know, more technology and more hands-on experience into engineering. Our problem today is there's too much of theory and less of hands-on. more recognition for project etc and that will not come if autonomy is given because autonomy will allow like the little sasabod said faculty to set their own curriculum etc so i think those things are you know allow us to implement this policy right now remove any hindrances that you might have and you will see results in 5 years because the students who come to engineering college is extremely bright and the point you made that our doctors do well very globally engineers but remember we have got 8 lakh engineers coming out only 55000 doctors Only fifty-five thousand. Now it's eighty-eight thousand seats coming in. Out of that eight lakh, two lakhs are really very high quality. One lakh students, one lakh engineering students are world class. They can work anywhere in the globe. So we can't compare one with the other because you know we got very large numbers. So I would say just that allow us to implement this straight away. Do all the regulatory changes right now so that we see it for the next academic year, putting it into force, and in five years' time you see a result. and there's nothing that that prevents this four year course and for using mathematics the policy does not allow you to specialize but does not prevent you from having emphasis on mathematics and anything there 
as uh, credits given to students in schools. And you know, it also says the students must pursue areas of their interest. So they could pursue mathematics if they want to do something. Because all children, by the time they come to class nine, have an inkling of what they want to do. So I don't think those uh, big issues are there. But the biggest issue which we want is give us the freedom immediately from next year to start implementing the policy. Put in a framework and then you'll see magic in five years. So very, very important is that freedom it has to be. Yeah. The, the, the strong autonomy it has to be given and institute should be able to enjoy that autonomy. MK Tiwari sir, Tiwari ji, what is your input about if 20 students will be entering into higher education, if that product will be in what way will it be in our sense? Uh, sir, just can you repeat your question because there were some interruptions actually. I'm saying in school education there will be many many changes now. And those school education students will be entering into higher education institutes. They will be different. The orientation of the students will be different. Their expectations will be different. In what way will it to change our higher education system so that immediately they should be, 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 will be accepting our system and they will feel happy. Education, especially technical education and uh, this is educational management. I want to say uh, the kind of policy we are following at present, like to encourage more entrepreneurship, encourage more startup culture, encourage them to uh, have more intensity with the industry and uh, have credit for all these things and allow them at present, say, for example, you are saying 20% credit they can share from the uh yeah, e-learning sources so i think in days to come because of this new normal that you are watching that uh, i should have been in your place had had there not been this pandemic actually uh, so like this we should have more online courses and other things so that way i think a lot of things which are in classroom type of things now they can learn by their own through proper repository and proper sources through different media that government has started from platform and others so I think there is going to be sea change in the culture. So most of the things which are common type of in nature that they will manage some different sources and where the boys will find more interest like say some good topic of research, good topic of interest like uh, challenging problems that, that is being thrown through the hackathon or type of other companies are throwing the problems that will attract uh, more innovative approaches among the students. Uh, and, and that sort of things will lead to better quality input uh, to the students and that way I think it will be uh, more uh, enjoying position for the institution. So accordingly we have to frame ourselves also, change ourselves to meet this uh, need and allow our faculty mindset to change that okay now only classroom is the not best way to uh, deal with them. We have to allow them to have interaction with the rest of the world through online media through other things and we also learn how to grade those kind of things okay sir? students are staying in the classes only for 10 percent time 90 percent time they'll be away from the classes they'll be doing their own own skills which they are having they'll be enriching those skills outside the classes there's no doubt about this one honorable chairman sir is here and and one question sir i'll be asking from you in your model of governance, which you had at College of Union Pune, there was a mechanism in effect where they were taking the advantage of the, the, the post governance members, even they were helping the institutes for achieving their vision or um, 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 achieving their mission by providing 100 hours. Every board of governance member was supporting that institute by giving 100 hours of, of their valuable time in a year for the development of the institute. What are your inputs are on this model? I think this is the only right model. It cannot be any other model because it is not meant for just taking a sitting fee or just to add to our CV that I am also on the board of governors of so many institutions but it is the passion and the commitment with which I am willing to contribute. You know, that contribution part is the most significant and important thing. And if I am not able to contribute because of whatever reasons, maybe family uh, difficulties, maybe you are already on a couple of jobs, so one cannot do it, then please excuse yourself. It is not just for theoretically being part of the 
management board or the governing board. I think that philosophy has to be adopted. And then, as uh, in the beginning, uh, Ashok Shatterji rightly pointed out that there must be review of the members of the board. It is not that uh, once you are uh, recruited someone as the board, he remains there forever. No, you, you check what, what a particular person has contributed in, in the first one year, two year. And if not, you, they should either withdraw themselves or we should have a provision to change the member of the board of governors. I think that is what is the spirit with which we have to move ahead. It means, sir, it means, sir, in teaching, when we are promoting any teacher according to AICT Gazette notification or UGC Gazette notification for the purpose of promotion, they let to have a certain level of FDP, they, they should have attended some some um, HTTP programs also, some some higher level of learning they let to have. Same mechanism, even in the case of a continuing board of governance members, some mechanism it has to be so that the, the level of those members, the, the confidence level which they are having or improvement which they are having, it has to be assessed. That, that's your idea. Chaturvedi sir, now... Uh, now the... no, no, I, I, I would like to intervene here. Very important point. Hmm. Uh, the, the, you rightly said that like faculty, when they have to be promoted, we expect them to do certain things, you know, including uh, attending some faculty development programs, understand new things which are happening. I think that also applies to the members of the Board of Governors. In, in our TechWip project, when there was a, the question arose that the Board of Governors also should attend certain training programs. So some members said, oh, I know everything. Who are they to teach us something? You know, if that is the philosophy, if someone is keeping in their mind, I think that is the, the last man to be on the board. And therefore, when we just with a with lot of fear told this to FC Kohli, he said, yes, I'm willing to learn. You know, at 95, I want to further learn. And learning is a lifelong learning process. So nothing is, no one is perfect. So someone will learn from me, someone will learn from Ashok Shatter, or someone will learn from Mohan Das Pai, someone will learn from uh, Chaturvedi ji or Tiwari ji. I think each one of us learn from each other. And that spirit, if it is not there, I think we are not uh, uh, supposed to be on that board at all, actually. That is what, what it is. Yeah. I so, agree. Yes, you know, yes, I, yes, I, please. I agree with, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Sastrabude because we have to set very high standards for the board. That's why I suggest a code of good governance, a code of good governance as a voluntary code to be done. And then maybe we can ask some rating agency, rating agency, the accrediting agency to rate them on the governance. And they should disclose how many hours they have spent, attendance records and everything. For example, State Bank of India disclosed all the attendance record of all the board meetings, how many meetings, what they have done. I think this disclosure, disclosure is key because disclosures will show to the public how things are happening. Of course, disclosure cannot bring forth quality. That's a different issue. At least they're doing that effort and all that is required to justify the existence. And we must have tough norms. I totally agree with Doc. Sir, that will put a lot of pressure. We all know that parliamentarians, how many hours they have attended also is re reflected. And that shows uh, who is doing what, actually. And, and yeah, that yeah. also is a yeah. sort of putting pressure on the people, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. In NITs now, when selection of faculty members are uh, being done, in that case, not only interview, in advance, they are, they are given some topics, they are coming into the institute, they are presenting in front of all the faculty members of that department, and even in front of students also. If same type of mechanism we can devise even for the board members, they should come, they should present their vision, what exactly they'll be contributing for the development of the institute in past, what is their contribution and on the basis of that one in place of some, some nomination, if some selection mechanism can be given at least for 50% members of the board. Uh, Chaturvedi sir, Ji. Now the, the type of leaders which will be needing for the institutes, they'll be just like digital leaders. Sara mechanism change or ICT ke through or education, it will be online. The the the, the e-content generation, everything. Now the conventional leaders probably in time to come may not work. What are your suggestions? What should be the attributes of a leader, particularly the dimensions of this ICT information communication technology in a leader? Uh, I think uh, uh, there will be a need of uh, organizing a series of uh, training programs for future leaders in this area uh, that is digital governance and digital leadership and digital transformation. Many of the institutions 
in our system are not uh, digitally transformed. This COVID has forced Indian higher education institution to start 100% uh, online classes. But in their governance, in their working, still paperwork is being done because uh, uh, we have not understood the requirement of digital governance and digital leadership. So you are right that we need to train the leaders who are running uh, technical institutions under the auspices of AICT. But one more suggestion I would like to give that uh, uh, Mondas Paiji has given us a cue that uh, nobody will wait for 20 years to see the fruits of uh, the good suggestions given under the national education policy. Can we think about at least uh, think about a fast track mode where the good institutions already being already been accredited by NEC or NBA, they are they are given 100% autonomy and uh, degree granting powers within next two years. Because unless we showcase the validity of the strong belief in the national education policy that autonomy, governance, good leadership, uh, digital transformation, connect with the society, all these things are required to become a, an excellent institution. I think we need to showcase and to showcase the, the, the success of NEP recommendation, we need to have a fast track channel also where the good, very good institutions are given full autonomy as envisaged in NEP. is very much supporting these human values is is responsible for implementing our induction program it is 21 days induction program in every institute when students they are they are entering their orientation towards the the, the society orientation towards having friendship in, in that whole whole new environment they connect with faculty members everything that's very very important now, Rajivji, my my question is: We are we are we are trying to implement the, the 21 days this induction program. Then one subject we have kept in, in universal human values also. In what way you will inculcate these human value in leaders? So for these values, it has to be the, the, the part of their personality of human values. Then only students will be following that one. Then only new teachers will be following them. What sort of traits you are? expecting in the leaders as far as these human values are concerned. Thank you, sir. Uh, we started the discussion with uh, Professor Shetter and the first of the foremost point of the discussion was weakest point in Indian higher education is the governance. You started with this uh, phrase, sir, and I do agree with that. And the main reason for uh, this is that the uh, values and ethics in the top leadership is the foremost important. Uh, you discussed few examples, few, few case studies in terms of COAP or your institution, etc. And if you look all these best institutions in the country, you find the ethics and work culture and the values in the top leadership were the foremost reason for their excellence. So we started that we should inculcate such type of values right from the student's point. Because our students now, what is the culture that they are starting at even at eighth or ninth, they are totally cut off from the society. They are always going to the coaching classes. They hardly know their grandparents also now. The system has come to that extent. They hardly know their grandparents also now. Because either they to your mom or their father and brother and sister, if they have, because now we have only one or two child presently. So the student is totally cut off from the society. And when he's entering in the technical education system, he is knowing only the subjects, physics, chemistry, mathematics, particularly, and what is happening around the world, even that, that he's not knowing what to talk about the society. So we started this uh, human value, uh, human value program and the induction program with this motive to bring that student to the mainstream. He was very good when he was in the fifth class in the music. He was very good in the sports like badminton. He has not taken part in all such activities in the last six and seven years. 
so he get time to explore himself during these three days three weeks so he interact with peers he get get good space to explore himself and when i was attending one of the program uh, started this human value program at iit bhu one student was bulky and he when he came in the morning to attend that program his re immediate reaction was uh, when we asked uh, what 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 is your reaction on this program he said sir i saw the rising sun that was the important thing we can learn so this is the situation and same thing is happening with our faculty members with our leaders also because the appointment of the leaders or the selection of the leaders as we all discussed is done in in totally in transparent way so this ethics and values you cannot expect in today's uh, leaders so this is the main reason and for that we started uh, human uh, uh, this faculty development programs in human values and we are training our faculty where they came, uh, comes to know about uh, himself about his family about the society and as environment as a whole so all these things is a part of this faculty development programs in human values and during this covid period today also i sometimes almost daily myself or chairman sahab or vcm sahab they are inaugurating one or two faculty development programs on human values today also we inaugurated one program in the morning and you will be surprised to know previously there were only 3 300 or 400 registrations now in each and every program registrations today there were 1500 registrations in the program we have to rest, uh, restrict the number of participants and we also have the limited resources because we are not having the resource persons those who have conduct number of uh, uh, these faculty development programs simultaneously so we are restricting so far we have trained in last two and a half years around 20000 faculty members with five days faculty development program but this is not this is just a starting we have to conduct eight days faculty development program and one month faculty development program so that they can become a, a resource person to conduct faculty development programs for other teachers so this is the initiative we have taken and leadership is definitely part of that human uh, values program and with that initiative eic aict is working presently and uh, in uh, we hope in time to come we will at least able to inculcate something as far as values and ethics are concerned in our leaders prospective leaders thank you rajiv ji very good it means the, the mindset of teachers are changing if teachers are changing then education system is changing country is changing aict is also changing aict is changing one of the reason is the type of leader which we are having everyone in the country is lucky particularly you are connected with technical education maybe parents students industries everyone lucky that we are having such type of transparent visionary leader and that matters in fact leadership matters governance matters there is no doubt about this one i'll be requesting uh, colonel venkat because many uh, many of the audiences which are connected they may be having lot of queries in their mind from the experts they will be asking some questions sir grafun sir the uh, either way almost all the questions on the platform i have replied already <laughs> yes we we we, we I, I, i always do multitasking i do there something here something <laughs> so i already done that he is doing multitasking that's uh -huh. also very important one another dimension of a leader he is taking <laughs> lot of tasks simultaneously Absolutely. yes <laughs> Yes, sir. Our chairman is actually speaking reply to each one of them. <laughs> for the purposes of uh, audience, I was also logging onto the YouTube and certain queries. How many you... people are connected YouTube. at this particular juncture? YouTube and sir, we have around two hundred plus connected here only as of today as part of the attendees. And on YouTube, it is it is quite quite uh, open. It is touched about six fifty when I was just about checking the last time, sir. So people keep seeing it at a later Even stage. Even if ordered, this will be available yes, sir, yes, for everyone. Yes, 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 sir. So generally, bulk of the people take it at a later stage. Hmm. As a bulk of the uh, issues, though covered very rightfully, that a leader is a must in case of any kind of governance. However, any organization or institute is defined by its resources, especially the human capital. Uh, 
any question as to in addition to leaders what is the bulk of the resources especially the human portion also the way it needs to be addressed towards making it a accountable institution Uh, can you sir kya okay. uh, sir uh, would any of the panelists be uh, willing to take on this subject as to any requirement or any direction which needs to be focused on on making this human capital of the complete institution or organization also on board in addition to only the leader so no, you see that uh, you, you must remember what dr anil sarsapude said first there has to be a lot of discussion with everybody who are involved students faculty and maybe you know members of the civil society who are involved as to the vision the mission etc so that everybody congruous to a point like you said we should meet on sunday holidays etc a lot of discussion because everybody has meet together and then after that you must have an operational plan given bottom up like you said very important because people have to feel it belongs to them the sense of belonging comes when you contribute and when you make your own decisions and third people must be given operational freedom to achieve what they want with a proper guidance that means there must be a maker checker if i want to do something somebody should be there to look at it and give some views so that you know it can be molded together because the vice chancellor or the director of an institute has to make sure that everything comes together that is a job and then they must have the space to execute with the reviews every quarter or whatever it is at the board level or the institution level so i think by this inclusiveness by doing everything you develop human capital now as far as values are concerned the most important thing for values are leadership by example what did gandhi ji do gandhi ji led by example he will never ask you to do something which he will not do so i think leadership example that means the organization should have a value statement an ethics statement which is published and the leader should follow that and once they follow automatically come down and the teachers too will start following and then there has to be cultural sensitivity which is lacking what are the cultural sensitivity we must inculcate in our students we belong to a country called india we are indians we are not westerners we are not white people we are indians <laughs> we don't belong to some other culture we belong to this culture sanskriti whatever it you know what you said so we have to make sure that we understand what india is how india is we have to live with the people and for that they must go on many programs to the surrounding towns surrounding villages to in industry etc interact with society in a much bigger way because in the top 200 institutions in this country in engineering the top 10 15% of society comes there the bottom doesn't come the bottom doesn't come it's very elitist is very elitist in terms of background etc because they have the wherewithal to enter and pass the test very few people from the bottom come people from rural areas don't come to the top 200 private institution government of course has got reservations uh, many many people from rural areas don't come many people from communities which are not so developed don't come the people who come are all the english speaking crowd because they have got english education etc so they must have interactions with outside and then more and more exposure to indian culture has to be given indian culture indian values and when you have multidisciplinary studies you must have studies on indian civilization without ideology not the jnu ideology which is very wrong but free of <laughs> ideology based on facts and history what india is etc and you know our great epics i would uh, say very clearly every student should study the ramayana and mahabharata because in the west you study the Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. In the entire West, classical education is study the Odyssey and Iliad. Why? Because they are the foundation civilization. Our foundation civilization is the Ramayana and Mahabharata. It is germane to India. I would say study. That could be difficult because of the left and everybody else. But we must have a broad-based curriculum to make them understand what India is, and that means expose them to local culture. For example, in Karnataka, I would like more of Kannad Kannada dramas and music and Kannada. Uh, you know poetry to be there in our colleges people come with local languages expose them to all these bigger things of life so that they understand by doing all this we can expose them to a civilization to our culture they will be rooted and we need to instill nationalism and love for our country 
May, many people have it, but they become indifferent because we don't have a crisis. Our love for the country comes to the fore when there's a crisis. We are not living in a crisis. Yes, we got China somewhere, but you know, that army will take care of it. Everybody's on a crisis. So we got to inculcate love for a flag, love for a country, because you know, there's love and nationalism for a country. Nationalism not in the Western construct, in the Indian construct, where we believe in a Matra Bhumi. This is very important. No, I'm saying, I got a very Western education, an English education. All right, I was in a Jesuit, Jesuit school. I was a Jesuit college. Then I'm a charter accountant. I've lived in a technology company, which is state of the art. I work, I work with the people around the world, but I'm a very good, I'm an Indian. I love my country, I love my culture. Why is that? Because of my family, my parents, what they taught me, what they did. My father spoke about the Ramayana Mahabharata to me every night before he went to bed. So it came from the parents. Now, I have not passed it on to my children because I've been too busy. And that's the state of everybody who comes to engineering colleges. So we need to have this broad-based, India-based culture there to give the values, to give all this so that we create a very holistic uh, India. Very good, sir. And Chairman, sir, you had a question about the College of Engineering Pune ka, jo vision mission statement. Tha. Ek method can be that you have done something and you will be forcing to everyone that you please try to achieve this one. That may be one of the approaches. But your approach was that you took everyone with you and the most important thing was that you have been part when, when the statement, vision mission statement was being designed. And, and, and that approach, it is, it is being said that you got success because that type of approach you had, everyone felt ownership for achieving that vision and mission statement. You have to have uh, uh, You have Mohandas Pai Ji had already replied. See that ownership is important. How do we develop it? Only when you are actively involved in the formation. So then you don't feel that this policy or this vision or this goal has been thrust on me from above. Uh, HOD or Dean or Principal or Director has Ask me to do this, then the rule will come. So a rule case of say itna karna hai, usse jada main nahi karunga. This approach will come. Whereas when you are involved in the formation of that vision, mission, goal itself, you will always feel that this is mine. I have to achieve it. I think that is the most important thing. And Punya ji, you are all remembering all our uh, student induction program workshops, which we are holding for the universal human values. All the teachers, thousands of them are, today itself one of them was started. Each one of them who have been involved in that, they have started becoming, thinking about ownership. I think, when will promotion, when will I get this, when will I get this, all of them have forgotten. Now, what can I do for the institute? Like the American president had said, what do you give to the nation rather than asking from the nation? You know, similarly, our people who have been trained in these workshops are also feeling the same uh, philosophy. And the three-week induction program will make the students that way. I think that is the starting point. Once we have that culture grown into the institution, that this is mine. And whatever happens, I will own it. So if there is something wrong happening, I will try to correct it. I will not only criticize. You know, criticism is always very easy. But how do I correct it? What contribution I can make so that correction can happen? And there are a few examples through our this student induction program. Earlier, when there was some water crisis in the hostel, etc., they used to break the doors of the toilets and uh, and all that. And when they went through this, they said, "Okay, pani nahi aa hai, to ja bucket le ja ke kahin se leke aayenge." Or or wo thoda sa usko weak hai, wo nahi la sakta hai, to usko bhi madad karenge. I think this is what is ownership. I think this is what is getting developed. Very good. And, very good. Uh, my uh, association there, that experience has come very, very handy, and everyone started feeling one with the organization. Very good, sir. So, a good leader is that if the team is winning, the leader says, "We won." If the leader is winning, he says, "I am winning." Means leader says, "I am winning." Whole responsibility he is taking, and that is basically ownership. This is called ownership, sir. And in ownership, there should be a share of responsibility. That is very important. So this is beauty of a leader कि वो सब को रिलाइज कराता है कि ये हम सब का है कि वो लोन फॉर माइंड ऑफ एवरीवन इस दी 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 रियल क्वालिटी ऑफ़ लीडर इस करने सर सर वेरी राइटफुली मोस्ट ऑफ़ द पॉइंट्स हैव ऑलरेडी स्पीकिंग बीन कवर्ड एंड मोस्ट ऑफ़ द फोकस हियर हैपेंस टू बी ऑन एक्चुअली स्पीकिंग अ क्वालिटी लीडरशिप Along with responsibility, which quite obviously comes at the people at the top level, comes accountability and transparency. How do you 
how do you measure this and how do you implement it? So this is a general question which comes in the forum and uh, if any of the panelists... So, so, so one, one thing which I started off when I joined here was whenever there used to be some RTI questions, our, our uh, uh, officers used to somehow give very vague answers and try to giggle out of that. And the first thing I said is, why are you not giving straight away whatever answer is there for that question transparently, accurately, number one. And by seeing at the question, we should understand what is the intent. It is something similar to the star question in the assembly and parliament. When a mm -hmm. parliamentarian asks a star question, his uh, target is not that question and the answer. He wants to uh, take you around and ask many more things later in the star question, in the parliament question hour. Similarly, when a person asks an RTI question, he has something in mind, he is disturbed. And therefore, not only you answer that question appropriately with all full information, but you give something more than what he has asked, assuming that he wants it. I think the, the number of questions start getting reduced. Secondly, our all minutes of the meeting, I don't know why they were not being posted on the website. Whatever decision we are taking, we are discussing and transparently we are taking those decisions. Maybe not all decisions may be correct, it doesn't matter. But we have taken it as a collective decision and post it on the website. And if that transparency is maintained, number of questions reduced from hundreds of them to hardly tens or twenties in just one, one and a half year time. And today our uh, entire set of bureaus are comfortable. Where most of the things are available on the website. I think that is the, uh, the transparency that we should follow. I think that is most important. No Thank you, Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to take this question. See, with the empowerment uh, also comes the accountability. Yeah, uh, in as a vice chancellor, my board has empowered me a lot. But at the same time, uh, uh, there is a process wherein, for example, every year I present certain uh, uh, goals to be accomplished. I mean, how, what exactly as a leader uh, uh, I need to drive. Okay. So, uh, in, uh, after a year, I mean, almost uh, in the fourth quarter, I'll be presenting again to the board what really happened i mean how exactly is the progress i have made in uh, 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 reaching those particular goals in fact this happens not only with the uh, board of governors this also happens with uh, uh, our academic council okay A certain academic goals also will be committing okay so uh, and when you have independent directors when you have very credible people in your academic councils and boards, uh, this is the way uh, they expect a leader to function. Okay, So I would say with empowerment, a lot of accountability. Empowerment as a vice chancellor will increase only when I am able to fulfill whatever I have promised. I was just telling uh, uh, the quality norms along with the standards. Uh, when I was uh, dealing with the uh, what you call ranking of the institutions and also being part of uh, some document that were to be filled for the IOE, and then now the Ministry of HRD, uh, sorry, Education, they ask a set of the MOU to be signed among the institutions. Sir, they are taking care that what target and what goal you are setting with respect to the different aspects of the uh, your excellence like number of publications type of publications classroom teaching student feedback and uh, your other social uh, responsibilities innovations almost all such questions are there and uh, once uh, you decide that target then it should be given to the almost everybody is part of that whether it's faculty non faculty etc so if we simply develop a monitoring mechanism to chase those targets 
I'm sure that ki the kind of uh, scientific principles are being evolved. Uh, that that itself will take care to the next higher level among the institutions. Maybe QS or THE, whatever you call it, or in IRF, they have also very well set up standards. So, like say how to increase your TLR ratio, how to use your uh, increase your employability ratio. So, all such things, there are enough measures, and uh, I am sure that sensitive institutions uh, they need not bother about uh, setting. They are already set standards. Only thing that you attach all these things with the performance of the faculty and staff. And once you do it, I think uh, uh, things will automatically improve by monitoring properly. That's all, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, may we request now our Honorable Member Secretary, Professor Rajiv, sir, to please speak a few words. <clears throat> Before extending the formal thanks to all of our panelists, I will uh, like to summarize the discussion today, what we have. Very I have noted some points. So, uh, actually, we, this is the last in the series. It is the eighth one. We decided to, some, uh, we have divided the whole education policy in eight parts and the discussions were held uh, from the last two weeks. They are, uh, we are conducting these such discussions. And as far as governance is concerned, this point was discuss discussed in earlier discussion also. and. One of the uh, key issue, which I will like to mention here that uh, most of the panelists, including our chairman, they, he emphasized mainly on to, for identifying the uh, competencies of the teachers. That is the most important point, because as chairman was rightly pointing out today also that uh, every teacher is not good in teaching or every teacher is not good in uh, research. So it is the role of the leadership to identify the competence competencies of the teacher and accordingly he should be motivated and in this area regulatory bodies like ugc and aict should also give freedom to the institutions so we are working on that so this was the thrust of the earlier discussion as far as governance is concerned now the today's discussion was started by professor ashok shetter he mentioned the important point that weakest point in indian higher education system is the governance as i already a brief and the another point he highlighted was the independent board members in board of governance board members from the diverse background is a need people do not ask critical questions to the board and responsibility of the board must be well defined performance evaluation of head of the institutions as well as the board members must be done so these were the key points, apart from other things from Professor Shetter, then Professor uh, Mohandas Pai. He said that AICT must have a policy to consolidate, consolidate the colleges. He started with this comment and then strategic institutional development plan in view of the NEP 2020 must be prepared by the AICT. Good governance, he made a very important statement that good governance is a culture. Uh, if I'm wrong, colleges, sir, prepared by the colleges and submitted to AICT. Yeah, so sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Please, please, thanks for correcting me, sir. Yeah. Uh, he made a very important point that uh, good governance is a culture. And the process of selecting head of the institution like VC and directors must be transparent. There should not be two set of rules in an institution. Less nominations from the government side in the boards. Board, bo board's role in arranging the... Uh, there should be uh, no, not much interference of the board in the daily functioning of the institutions. Faculty appointment must be fair. One member in board from the ex for the external work or licensing for transparency, that means interacting with the regulatory bodies and other bodies also. Research is not possible through students' fee. So uh, that is also a very important point as far as institution is concerned and leadership by example. So these were the few comments I could uh, make out from the discussion with Professor Pai. Now our chairman also highlighted that persons from the same institutions they should not be, they should not head the same institution. Mm -hmm. So that was the important uh, comment made by Honorable Chairman. 
and Professor Tiwari discussed the challenges of the government institution and how it can be improved as, the, as far as the board of governors of these institutions are concerned. And then Professor Harivans Chaturvedi ji talked about leadership, autonomy and governance said that they are all interrelated. There is not much difference. You cannot talk any of the things in isolation. Involvement of stakeholders in framing the policy is very important. And he appreciated that we gave the AICT, gave the uh, graded autonomy of some of the institutions in the country, PGDM institutions. So, and all the stakeholders, they were involved in making framing such type of policies. Now, Dr. Himanshu Rai from I am Indore uh, gave importance on the mentoring of the institutions and he said that I am like institutions should mentor more institutions in the nearby and exchange of ideas with tier two and tier three institutions faculty is very, very important. And he also emphasized that we should that I am must conduct and I am ready to conduct short term programs on leadership for the faculty of the institutions. So this was the summarization by uh, of the discussion from the various panelists. And if I have forgot to mention anything, any panelist, please forget me or please correct me here. Uh, we will send this report draft report today itself. We will share with all the experts their inputs also again, then we will be finalizing and we will be sending to MHRD. We can send draft MHRD today, but final report we can send to your inputs. Just one more thing that I said, I want to say that uh, for implementation of the NEP, we have to divide the many tasks into sub tasks and accordingly, as per the project plans, we have to roll out along with the timeline schedules that for higher education, for primary education, for regulating body, for uh, online board, for vocational courses, there are complete timeline we have to define and accordingly it should work. And I will send you a document where we have done some primary work and it will be for your reference. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, in last, I will now extend formal thanks. I will thank Sri Mohandas Pai Ji, who spared his valuable time and shared his ideas. And your ideas, sir, they are very, very important as far as framing the policy and in terms of the governance is concerned. I will also thank Professor Ashok Shetter, who is associated with the AICT, who framed some of the policies of the AICT, and we are getting constant. Um, support and help from your institution and personally from you, sir. Thank you very much for sparing your time. I will also like to thank Professor M. K. Tiwari, who is also associated in a with AICT and you also our executive committee members and his ideas and uh, suggestions we are constantly getting in making all such things possible, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I will also like to thank Dr. Harivans Chaturvedi ji, who is who has made valuable suggestion as far as management education and uh, uh, improving the curricula or how we can impart autonomy to the institutions so your suggestions we are constantly getting sir and i hope in future also aict will keep on getting your suggestions and you are helping aict in all the ways whatever required we are calling you we are writing you sir thank you very much for uh, sparing your time and I also thank Dr. Himanshu Rai, who is the director of I am Indore, and who open-heartedly supported the idea of mentoring and voluntarily said that I am are ready to volunteer the nearby tier and tier three institutions and to impart faculty training as far as leadership is concerned. So in last, I extend my thanks to 